everyone. And uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, our conversation tonight about race patriotism and constitutional memory is part of an ongoing series we've been having at Barrett about racial justice issues. So I'd first of all like to thank Barrett's leadership and staff for making this one possible, especially our Associate Dean of Barrett Downtown, Olga Davis, who's been such a visionary in imagining Barrett's leadership on this issue. Um, would also like to thank Dr. Kerry Gatewood, who had the idea of hosting an event this week on race and patriotism. I uh, would also like to acknowledge the many indigenous nations who call the land ASU stands on home, most notably the Akamel Otum and the Peeposh nations. So when Dr. Gatewood approached me about the possibility of organizing an event on this theme, I knew immediately I wanted to host Aziz Rana. So I'm super excited he's been able to join us this evening. Uh, Aziz is the Richard and Lewis Cole Professor of Law at Cornell University. And he earned his B BA and PhD at Harvard and his JD at Yale. He's published on questions of race, colonialism and constitutional law in multiple prestigious law and humanities journals as well as in public venues, including the Atlantic Monthly, The Guardian, and The New York Times. He's the author of Two Faces of American well, not, Freedom. Not the Atlantic, uh, so maybe N oh, plus shoot. 100%. <laughs> Did I get the Atlantic wrong? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was that's no problem. Going, going off, off the uh, Cornell website there. Um, well, N plus one, let's say N plus one. <laughs> um, and he's the author of Two Faces of American Freedom, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2010. Uh, here at Barrett, we really value interdisciplinary scholarship and learning. And I think the story of how I came to be introduced to Aziz's research speaks to his remarkable breadth as an interdisciplinary scholar. When I was a second year grad student, I was in an, at an academic conference hosted by UCLA's American Indian Studies program, focused on questions of race and sovereignty, where I was presenting a paper on Mark Twain. And I, I kind of shudder to think what that paper must have been like at this point. But um, I happened to sit in on a panel where Aziz was presenting on his recently published book. And I was so impressed with his talk that I bought the book the following week. And if you've ever lived on a grad school budget, you know that that's a big deal, right? And that book was The Two Faces of American Freedom, uh, which argues that American conceptions of freedom were born, to quote Aziz, precisely in the context of slavery and native expropriation and cannot be understood without an honest account of these evils. Nonetheless, he argues, American accounts of freedom give voice to a liberating vision of collective possibility, and that history offers glimpses of moments where Americans have been able to imagine a form of, of smaller Republican liberty that was not tethered to the violence of conquest or slavery. Uh, his exploration of this contradiction in U.S. legal archives was an inspiration for my own research in U.S. literary archives, and in many ways, it was his interdisciplinary example that encouraged me to expand my own scholarship to engage questions about the Second Amendment and U.S. gun culture. The Two Faces of American Freedom opens with a meditation on the first inauguration of Barack Obama in 2009. I'm excited to have Aziz here to talk us through a very different moment of transition uh, in America this evening. Aziz, before we dig into your work, uh, we have a lot of Barrett students uh, in the audience thinking about careers in law, scholarship, and public service. Uh, could you talk us through how your own American story led you to your particular career in legal, legal scholarship and your focus on, on the issues of race and colonialism that you explore in your work? Yeah. Well, so first, I just want to say thank you so much um, for that lovely introduction. And it's uh, wonderful to, to be here. Thank you to, to Alex, um, to Kira, and um, to everybody else, RG, that was involved in putting this together, and, and to all of you um, out there uh, in front of your computer screens that are, that are watching this as, as well. Uh, so, you know, maybe I can just start with a little bit about uh, my, myself as well. So, you know, my... Uh, I come from a multiracial background. My mother is Lebanese American, so she was born and raised in the US, but is of Lebanese descent. My father is Kenyan, and he's half Indian and half African, and he lives in Kenya, and, is, and that entire side of my family is still there. They met in the US in graduate school um, through anti colonial and anti apartheid activism. And in many ways, the family that I was part of was really probably best understood as a third world family. I thought of myself as a person of the third world and it really shaped uh, 
my own sense of self and my idea of, you know, both heroes from Lumumba to, you know, Amilcar Cabral um, uh, to, you know, to others that were involved in various forms of um, anti-colonial resistance. And as I got older, that actually ended up influencing how I wanted to think about the, the work that I did. I decided to do a PhD in political science because really at the time I wasn't thinking about becoming an academic, but I wanted to write a book on, a to on topics that seemed that were like really close to what I cared about. And in particular, I thought that I was gonna write on the post-colonial African nation state. So I took a lot of classes in, in graduate school in African history, African political science. And at the same time, you know, I decided to go to law school and at that point, again, it wasn't really something that was clearly specified, but I knew that in the US, so much of American politics ends up turning on questions of law. And so I wanted to have an opportunity to engage with the issues that I found like most significant and most important. And at that point, I was really thinking about American power, American foreign policy, the politics of the national security state. My first year in law school, was the year that the US uh, ended up going to war in Iraq, so the second Iraq war. And that ended up really shaping a lot of how I thought of both how I wanted to intervene as a political and legal person in the US, but then also what kind of writing I wanted to do. And in the context of the war and my own sort of activism at the time in opposition to it, I decided that rather than writing directly on Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, that I wanted to take all of that work that I'd been doing to make sense of the Asian and African experience and to essentially apply it to the US, to think of the US as part of the global history of colonialism and to take many of the same concepts that, have, that are generally used to, to apply to, to Asia and Africa, to think through the particularities of how American power operates and what still like the incipient possibilities for change might exist in the US. And the two basically came together where I found myself doing this, this work that was a, a sustained colonial reading of the American experience while at the same time getting a law degree that I hoped would allow me through cases that I you know, became active in, but then also through my own scholarship and conversations and engagements would allow me to link both a scholarly commitment and a political one. Wow, that's fascinating, um, especially as it relates to your engagement with settler colonial studies as a, as a kind of extension of those um, third world commitments. But um, thinking about your more recent work uh, on US constitutionalism and constitutional memory, um, I, I want to you know, ask you a question that might lead us into some considerations of that work in relation to our contemporary moment. And um, you know, we often think of the U.S. broad, broad we here uh, as a nation of ideas, as opposed one tethered to a racial or ethnic identity. Uh, although you know, there's been some contestation, obviously, on that idea of, of U.S. identity recently. But you know, uh, looking back to the Cold War and the Obama administration, this is an idea expressed by Paul Ryan and and Barack Obama, right? Um, but that commitment to what you call in some of your recent work, the American creed, you have argued that we need to kind of rethink our relationship to that creed imagined as a broad commitment to egalitarian and democratic ideals. Uh, re rethink our, our commitment to that creed in relation to our relationship with the constitution. It's right. So you talk us through how some of your recent work thinks about that issue. Sure. So my first book that, that Alex, um, you know, you, you so kindly described and mentioned, um, the basic argument is that we can understand most of American history as a sustained experiment in what I call settler empire. In other words, the U.S. combined U.S. settlers that, that came from England and then later other parts of Europe combined a very rich internal account of freedom with an external politics of expropriation and, uh, and subordination. And in particular, they saw that the basic precondition for enjoying economic independence, political participation as requiring the expropriation of indigenous land. So conquest is really essential. This is why it's a settler empire. 
and the coercive use of dependent labor, in particular, the labor of enslaved persons to engage in the hard but necessary forms of work um, that were required for economic um, well-being for those that were insiders. And so this, this was like a really significant part of the life of the country. It defines the basic institutional ideological architecture in the late 19th, early 20th century. Even if people might not have used the term settler empire or settler colonialism more generally, um, what I just described would have been, would have made sense as what defines the Republic. Teddy Roosevelt, for example, when Japan defeated Russia in, um, in war in 1904-1905, sent part of the Pacific Fleet on a tour of Australia and New Zealand um, based on the idea that just as those countries are white men's countries, so too is the US. So the Americans very much understood themselves as part of a set of settler siblings that included you know, white apartheid South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, a variety of other um, Anglo colonies in particular. So the thing that became interesting for me when I finished the first book and I started working on the second book was, why is it that Americans today, by and large, don't see themselves in this, these terms? And not only do they not see themselves as part of a particular settler history or settler past, but they actually tend to reproduce in public life the idea that really to be American is to repudiate settlerism, to be the very opposite, to be this like nation of ideas. And the argument that slowly I, I kind of came up with was that this has a lot to do with the US's emergence as a global power over the course of the 20th century. And in particular with the dynamics that shape the US's emergence as not just a global power, but the global superpower, the American century in the context of World War II and the Cold War. That the US became a global power at just the historical moment where much of the rest of the world was decolonizing at the time when the, you know, the big European empires were essentially collapsing. And it meant that for the US to be able to make arguments about why it enjoyed, enjoyed power on the global stage, it couldn't make arguments in the traditional kind of imperial way of saying you know, that we essentially hold dependent colonies, we treat uh, foreign societies as extractive assets, Instead, more and more officials increasingly argued, drawing from what you can think of as sort of like Cold War, excuse me, Civil War abolitionist claims, that really the U.S. was the first truly anti-imperial society. It broke free from, from England. It was committed from the founding to the principles of the Declaration of Independence, and that those principles were given concrete teeth in the Constitution, the federal Constitution, and what the US promotes abroad is this combination of equality and constitutionalism. And this is what I call the American creed, drawing from um, Gunnar Myrdal and a number of other scholars from the mid 20th century. And that when the US asserts power on the international stage, when it claims a right to intervene in foreign countries, it's not acting as an empire, it's actually acting in the interests of other societies because at the end of the day, American interests are the world's interests. And the constitution becomes really key here because the story of how the US expanded across the continent was expropriation of native land. And then at a point in which territory was demographically transformed into effectively white territory, having state constitutions, mini constitutions, that was the precondition for then that state being included in the union. So constitutionalism from the beginning of the Republic has been really key to the idea of replicating quote unquote American institutions and practices and transforming land that is indigenous land into effectively American set settler land. And that basic concept got projected onto the global stage though shorn from an awareness of the, 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 you know, the colonial roots got projected onto the global stage as the way that the US replicates democracy around the world is by replicating the particular form of constitutionalism that marks the American project. And that becomes a really defining feature of American ideology in the mid 20th century and comes to shape how Americans even today think of both what's distinctive about the country and what the American mission abroad is.
Yeah, so, you know, thinking through this juxtaposition between this internal account of liberty and this external, you know, uh, material practice of conquest um, that, that sort of came to be um, uh, expressed in this idea of the American creed. In, in your work, you offer an account of the Black radical tradition from Frederick Douglass on through the Black Panthers and, and I think on, on to, to BLM right now, right, that it gives an alternate account of, of liberty, right, that, that um, imagines it um, as, as not dependent on those, those acts of, of conquest. Uh, and I, I wonder if you could talk us through a little bit how you see the Black radical tradition kind of writing back against this conception of imperial conception of the American creed. Yeah, so I'd say that one of the things that's really distinctive about Black politics and the Black counterpublic, you know, really throughout the entire history of the American experience is a profoundly ambiguous and disenchanted relationship to, the, to American nationalism. Um, and so you have one strain of Black politics, and I think that Douglas here is a, a, a good sort of um, embodiment of this, where Douglas is going to say, even um, before, you know, before the Civil War, that the Constitution is an anti-slavery document. And he's going to articulate the idea that we should think of the U.S., this is what he says during the period of Reconstruction, as a composite nation, a nation really for no single um, racial or ethnic community, but potentially open to all. Uh, and he's going to present a strong view of what I, what I call the creed, but claiming that the U.S. has the potential to basically redeem a set of sins that have been with the country from the founding. Um, you know, at the same time as he's making those arguments, he's also, you know, giving speeches like, what is the, what to, uh, what is the 4th of July to the slave? Um, which highlights the sense of disenchantment with the national project and, and exclusion. Um, but there's a way in which you, you've had a set of Black political actors that have attempted to give the most radical version of the creedal reading as a way of presenting an account of redemption, not necessarily believing, frankly, that the white, like a white majority or white political elites genuinely believe these principles, but articulating them with the aspiration of fulfilling um, a, set of, a, a set of principles that might be embedded in the American project. And that's been one line of reform that goes through the, the traditional civil rights movement that you can associate with the, the early king that you can see in like the politics of Obama that's present. Even today, interestingly, in things like the 1619 project where, you know, some of the essays end with the idea that to be African-American is to be the true American because you truly believe in the ideas of the creed. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's been another tradition that's been much more, let's say, explicitly critical of the national project, saying that, you know, at the end of the day, the only way to actually address sustained subordination in the U.S. is to, is to essentially um, transcend the nationalisms that have marked um, the, the politics of white settlement, and in doing so create a truly decolonized society. And these are arguments that you can associate with um, some of the calls for um, radical land reconstitution in the wake of the Civil War, where you had um, Black workers on plantations that wanted to communally control the land, to the politics of Hubert um, Harrison and kind of black socialist politics in the early 20th century to W.E.B. Du Bois, all the way through um, to folks that were involved in the, the Black Panthers. And, and just to do like a, um, you know, at a very high level of generality, the argument that emerges if you, if you follow that line is to say that the U.S. has been a very particular kind of colonial experiment. Um, there's been some uh, some inconsistency about whether or not to think of this as settler colonial or an internal colony or both, and we can get into the particularities of the, um, the colonial critique, but that if the U.S. has always been organized on racial terms to extract land and labor from colonized communities, then transforming the society will mean more than simply 
redeeming the nation by creating conditions of formal legal equality, it'll actually require, you know, disrupting at the level of um, basic economic structure of who holds sovereign power, um, the existing institutions, uh, based on the principle that those with power that are primarily um, uh, a wealthy and racial elite have interests that are fundamentally distinct from the interests of historically marginalized communities. And it also then leads to a specific set of arguments about like, well, what does decolonization mean? Decolonization means something similar to the arguments about decolonization in indigenous and in third world contexts. Namely, it means more than just an end to discrimination or some, um, you know, uh, so, uh, some uh, general shifts in economic and educational opportunity. It requires things like potentially writing a new constitution, which is what the Panthers try to do with the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention. It means, it means uh, genuinely sharing sovereignty with indigenous communities. It means a politics of land return or of reparations. It means um, thinking really seriously about uh, a guaranteed income as well as systemic forms of economic redistribution through ensuring that there's uh, there are uh, basic rights that are provided to certain kinds of positive socioeconomic goods like that there's universal access to health and education and housing. It means uh, fundamentally uprooting the security state uh, because policing and security apparatuses around the world have been really essential to sustaining um, colonial systems of control. So that means um, local control over policing, but you know, es essentially decarcerating and defunding existing apparatuses of authority. Uh, it might mean truth and reconciliation commissions, genuine apologies with, that have teeth that go hand in hand with civil or criminal punishment for people that have committed acts of violence in the past, and even symbolic changes like raising old flags, uh, excuse me, lowering old flags and raising new ones. And these were all part of what you can think of as the kind of black radical imagination by the time you got to the 60s and 70s. And it was built in part because of the, the presumption that black politics at the end of the day required transformations that could not be grounded in a kind of nationalist attachment that required an internationalist politics that understood the appropriate allies of, um, of black and brown people in the US as maybe not necessarily powerful co-nationals but communities around the world that were similarly struggling against various forms of colonial oppression. And those are two, uh, just to, I know I've gone long, but those are two distinct orientations to reform. An orientation that's about radical redemption based on a commitment to the creedal project and an orientation that's about rupture based on solidarity with colonized peoples. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can think a little bit in the present about the strengths and weaknesses of each. And frankly, in much of the contemporary forms of activism, we see variations of both kind of operating at the same time. Yeah, so uh, it's a, a fascinating answer thinking about the, the, the kind of creedal line versus the, this decolonial line we could call them perhaps, right? But um, I, I think in one of your articles, you call it the, the, the project of, of symbolic rupture and material redress, um, uh, thinking about decolonial politics, right? A, a line I've, I've quoted you on a couple of times, but uh, um, thinking about that in our present moment, we seem at a weird kind of conjuncture, right? Where we do have this resurgence of a sort of unapologetic white nationalism, arguably, right? Um, and uh, a uh, sort of, on the one hand, uh, a clear sense in which constitutional institutions are um, buttressing that, right? The Electoral College and the Senate and the various ways in which um, you know, racial representation in the US is, is, uh, is circumscribed by constitutional institutions, right? On the other, we, we've had a lot of talk and, and arguably uh, well-grounded talk, right, about the ways in which democratic institutions have limited our last administration um, in its ability to exert more autocratic forms of power. So I, I wonder where, um, thinking about those, those kind of two lines of critique you were talking about, mm 
uh, you find us now, right? Uh, does a, a kind of critique grounded in the democratic and egalitarian values we've been talking about, does that critique now demand a sort of anti-institutional approach or are the ways in which, are, or are there ways in which democratic institutions are now kind of protecting those values? Yeah, so I mean, that's um, that's a great question. I mean, I think the first thing to say about the resurgence of white supremacy in the US is, you know, from my perspective, this shouldn't be a surprise. Like if you just look at the long array of American history, and this is one of the things that's, that's sort of um, a central argument for my first book is that probably the most durable and longstanding ideological position is some combination of white nationalism and economic populism, you know, from Andrew, Je from Jefferson and Andrew Jackson, um, to speak somewhat anachronistically, all the way to, to like you know, George Wallace in the 1960s, and that in a way, the very the very particularities of New Deal, World War II against um, a, gen a genocidal Nazi regime, and the Cold War created a really specific contingent historical development that formed a particular type of you know, Cold War liberal consensus around small scale racial reforms and you know, a limited welfare state that came to be the politics that we're most familiar with and led elites of both parties essentially to rally toward the center against um, you know, the real bases that existed on the far, far right and on the left. Um, so in a way, we're living at a moment now, 30 years after the end of the Cold War, where the, you know, the formal end of the Cold War, where a lot of the, the political um, frameworks that made that compact uh, viable have basically disappeared. There's no external enemy. There's intense um, party polarization. The country's been living through a decade plus of rolling social crises from the Iraq war to the financial crisis to to the most recent pandemic, to um, mass incarceration and the, the social rebellions that, the, that our cities have faced on account of sustained racial subordination over the last half decade. And so now we're back basically in a political context where ideological positions that have had long standing historical support are kind of on the table. And so what does that mean about our institutions? My view is the problem of authoritarianism in the US is not a problem of quote unquote populism or a tyranny of the, the majority. It's a problem of the fact that we have what amounts to a minority that is a very particular kind of, you know, white minority in the Republican party that has basically been able to take advantage of the minoritarian dimensions of the constitutional system to exert disproportionate power. By this, I mean, this is stuff that now is probably familiar from the news, which is state-based representation is, means that um, you can control the Senate despite the fact that you actually have very you know, relatively limited popular support because of the, the rural versus urban divide that we're moving toward a place where 70% of the population might just be in 15 of the states. At the same time, um, Similarly, because of state-based representation, uh, you can control the Senate, you can control the presidency through the Electoral College, through the ways in which that's counter-majoritarian, and then using those instruments, you can control the Supreme Court. So, you know, Biden is the seventh Democrat in the last eight elections to have won the popular vote, and yet the Supreme Court is split 6-3 in favor of Republicans. Indeed, Trump didn't win the popular vote, lost two popular vote elections, and yet was able to nominate and confirm to the Supreme Court three justices, one less than all of the justices nominated and confirmed to the Supreme Court by Democrats since the 1960s. Indeed, the last time we've had a Democratic Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was somebody appointed in 1946 before Earl Warren. Um, what's problematic about this is that, and I, I hope you don't mind if I just take a moment to kind of develop this a bit more, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah, what's problematic about this is that in truth, in the 1980s, and I think you could even say in the 1990s, the Republican party could claim majority status. 
the policies embedded in the Republican Party had, you know, majority support, like lower ta lower taxes, limited government, the politics of Reaganomics. And one of the things that you expect when you have a, um, a democratic system is that as your views get less popular, including because of demographic shifts and political shifts within a society, that a party has to shift its own ideological composition in order to be able to respond to a majority, be able to maintain a majority. What's happened instead in the US is that because of all of these minoritarian dimensions, the Republican Party really has not had to shift its views. In other words, the party has views, economic views that are deeply unpopular, but that it's holding on to because they're central to the donor class of the party. And at the same time, demographically, it's increasingly become overwhelmingly, despite you know, the marginal vote gains for Trump in 2020, very clearly a, um, a, a racially defined party, that it's, it's a overwhelmingly a white party. And this means that increasingly the incentives of elites within the party is to invest in the instruments of minority rule so that their incentives within the party to maintain power despite not actually having majority support by investing in the instruments of counter-majoritarianism. And that to me is really like the danger of authoritarianism. So it's not, again, tyranny of the majority or populism. It's that the, the party apparatus is structured to sustain minority rule and given the fact that it has views that, that don't seem consistent with the majority, then over time, the party is becoming more and more invested in anti-democracy and opposition to democracy itself as its own sort of like basic foundational principle. And that's, I think, the real kind of institutional threat. I'll say a couple other things very quickly. The first is, I'm also wary of the idea that, you know, Trump was contained by the rule of law, because if you really think about the exercise of, of violence that Trump engaged in, it was largely through discretionary acts of the executive branch that were basically accepted um, by the courts. And that included things like separating families or engaging in violence at the border. Um, and it's not clear to me that that actually was constrained in any meaningful way. And indeed, this has been a longstanding problem of American institutions, which is for all the talk of norms, one of the norms seems to be a lack of accountability for people that engage in acts of violence, including the fact that the person that's the head of the CIA is somebody credibly accused of overseeing torture. But where Trump was contained by the institutions is just like the profound kind of paralysis of of American government. Um, but, you know, I think what that speaks to as much is some of the some of the fears about Trump becoming like a full blown authoritarian were overstated. But I think the authoritarian concerns going forward are about a party that increasingly is not invested in democratic principles and understands its own power is dependent on minority rule. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've already got some great questions coming in in the Q&A, and I would encourage people to go ahead and, and queue up more as you have questions uh, for Aziz. Um, I, as people are, are thinking them out, um, however, I, I just want to ask kind of one more question along these lines. I mean, you know, if, I mean, I totally agree that any kind of conception of, of Trumpism as a majoritarian populist movement, I feel like, um, runs into a lot of trouble real fast, right? In terms of its class and racial dimensions. Um, nonetheless, here, here in Phoenix, uh, a mile away from my office, right? We have uh, these uh, armed protesters lining up outside our counter recorder's office, you know, uh, demanding, um, it's, it's not entirely clear what to oversee the count or to end the count, right? Um, and represent this tradition of popular constitutionalism, right? Within the Republican party, that, that seems very anti-institutional, right? So I wonder how in, in your account, do you, um, where, where does that aspect of Trumpism fit in for you, I guess? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things. So the first is that there's a really interesting uh, history of 
what you can think of as like as as far right constitutional nationalism. So there's a scholar named Jared Goldstein that's working on this right now, um, finishing up a book on this topic. But you know, so so one of the events, for example, that some of your students might have participated in and that you might have heard of is this idea of Constitution Day. So on September 17th, the day that the 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 drafters of the, the Constitution signed the document that we now have this holiday where we, we celebrate the Constitution. The very first Constitution Day took place in 1917 in the context of World War I, and it was spearheaded by an organization called the National Security League, which uh, whose members ended up becoming closely identified with folks that were connected to the American Legion and a variety of other um, far-right pro-war groups, including later on the, the, the Ku Klux Klan as well. And, you know, the politics then was very clear, which was backing the constitution meant supporting a, a vision of a kind of militant constitutionalism, um, where you're, uh, you're willing essentially to bear arms or use violence to protect what you see as the, the nation state from all sorts of threats. And at the time, the threats were anti-war activists, labor activists, um, uh, uh, black freedom activists of various stripes. And, you know, I can, I, I think you can make a, a pretty kind of clear argument about the links between that version of constitutional, constitution worship that's actually quite distinct, let's say from the, the even like the Bush Obama creedal variety that marked the, the American Cold War and the kind of constitutional uh, constitution worship, constitutional nationalism that circulates around some of these um, uh, popular social movement formations today. Um, I'd also say that those voices, I think, are gaining more and more currency within the Republican Party, precisely as the Republican Party is turning away from a commitment to, to building something like a majority coalition. So this election I think is interesting in that somebody like Mitch McConnell really doesn't have very much interest, honestly, in delegitimizing the election, so to speak, even if he's gonna engage in lip service because you know he knows that the rules of the game are actually systematically skewed on behalf of the Republican party and that you have control of the Senate, you have control of um, the courts. It's not, it seems very likely that the next few years are gonna be totally paralyzed. And it's not inconceivable to think that Republicans will be back in the White House again because of the benefits of the Electoral College in 2024. But I think what a lot of this rhetoric and language that circulates around the election does, it's a way of generally delegitimizing um, uh, electoral democracy, and in particular, um, delegitimizing the social bases and constituencies that are, are now part of the Democratic Party's effective majority. So, you know, talk of of vote theft, but vote theft particularly in in African American um, view, uh, cities that are viewed as having large African American populations, like Detroit in Philadelphia that has all sorts of resonances and echoes with similar arguments that were made in the late 19th century. And the worry that I have is that at some point to break through our current political impasse, there's gonna have to be a moment where the US seriously thinks about ref like practically democratizing its institutions. So, you know, having DC as a state um, passing bills like HR1 that expand um, voting rights, um, engaging in significant court reform. So we don't have a court system where, you know, nine justices serving for life with no real opportunities for constitutional amendments actually determine what counts as constitutional in a way that's totally unlike what we see elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That those kinds of reforms which are necessary are also going to further feed um, the, the rights shift toward really this kind of politics of constitutional militancy and nationalism um, that's built around preserving or protecting a minority coalition that increasingly does not have interest in, in building a democratic majority. Right. Um, 
Well, I think a lot of the questions we have queued up kind of um, build on um, this conversation directly. Uh, let's see, um, we have a question. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of feed you a few here, Aziz, and you can kind of pick and choose uh, how to build on them. Kayla asks, uh, you know, how do, how do you remedy um, uh, this, this problem of minority rule? Uh, anonymous person asks, uh, you know, what does a reform of the two-party system have to do with breaking this impasse? Um, another participant asks, uh, Rishi asks, uh, sort of, do you feel like any of the court challenges will be credible uh, to to the election at this point? Um, uh, then uh, Kayla asks again, you know, is 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 the kind of um, pro-war attitude baked into the Constitution or or um, just in the ways people defend it. Um, maybe you, could, yeah. you could kind of pick up the threads you choose. Uh, yeah, so, so first on, I'll be very surprised if uh, these litigation efforts go anywhere because you know the nature of, um, uh, of how the, the federal judiciary is structured is that the Supreme Court uh, has to review um, concrete cases that come up um, from the bottom. And the, the simple truth is that they're just, you know, that the the fraud claims are 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 themselves fraudulent. I mean, they're the this is a language of vote theft that's being used as cover for an effort by by Trump to essentially try to steal an election or at least um, you know undermine the legitimacy of Biden's presidency so that he can he or somebody like him can continue to essentially run um, against the Democratic Party and build and foment. Opposition, but I, the the actual challenges themselves um, just aren't meritorious, and so I, I just don't see them proceeding in the courts. And I'd even say that if you know, for some of the the the, the Republican appointed justices on the court, folks like Roberts, Roberts is very concerned with the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, and it's a significant historical victory given the circumstances um, of the present, the power that the Supreme Court has for it to be six three. Republican appointees, especially at a moment in which the Republican Party has basically lost majority status. And there is very little appetite, um, you know, I'd say among uh, a number of different like Republican Party officials elites to actually endanger through um, going down this, this like rabbit hole with Trump, the kind of institutional power that the party can credibly hold despite not having popular power, popular support. Um, so that, that's one. Um, remind me what uh, the very first que uh, question was. We can maybe do this. I can do these in more rapid su succession. Let's see. Yeah, um, a, a question kind of about, um, you know, do you see a, a path forward from- The, the minoritarian path. Party yeah. party so, I mean, I think basically, you know, so it, if there were a silver bullet to me, the, the silver bullet would be simplifying the American constitutional amendment process. The US constitution is the hardest constitution in the world to amend. And so it, you need two thirds in the house, three fourths of the, the states to approve. And what this does is it funnels all the debates about constitutional change into the courts, which is one of the reasons why courts have become such a massive flashpoint and why folks even know who the Supreme Court justices are, which is not actually something that is particularly healthy for a democracy. You shouldn't really know who judges are because their power should not be this outsized. And a simplified amendment process, not unlike what exists at the states and what exists in most of the world, would mean that you could then um, produce institutional fixes relatively easily. But barring a simplified amendment process, which would be very, very hard to implement, I think what you know what a Democratic Party would have to do if it actually enjoyed unified power, let's say if the Democrats had controlled the Senate or if they were to get the Senate in 2022, is just a set of policies that are kind of already on the table. So statehood for DC to start to, to shift the composition of the Senate. Um, uh, so on the question of Puerto Rico, I think that Puerto Rico is a um, a colonized territory and the central issue there is not statehood to solve the, the problems in Washington, but what the actual genuine commitments of people in Puerto Rico are in terms of their own independence and autonomy. But then a lot of the stuff that is in HR1, so, um, you know, systematically uh, 
um, uh, combating uh, felony disenfranchisement, um, significant uh, reforms to the, the campaign finance system, changes to how house, you know, house districts are drawn, so um, critiques of, um, of gerrymandering, um, uh, reforms to the federal court system uh, writ large, you know, there are actual legislative fix, fixes potentially to the Supreme Court. Um, all of these are policies that one could imagine pursuing um, step by step, which would have really significant effects on democratizing the electoral system, making it possible then for a majority of the people to elect a government that can itself actually govern. And then thinking beyond that about more wholesale changes. And as part of the initial step, certainly getting rid of the electoral college through things like the, you know, the, the national popular vote initiatives. Um, but, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be really tough because for the time being, the, the actual institutions of governance are blocked. And then there's a question about whether or not the leadership of the Democratic Party is actually committed to these kinds of transformative changes if it were to, to enjoy um, greater power. On uh, the question about is the Constitution necessarily pro-war? No. Um, the, one of the things that I'm, I'm interested in is the way in which discourses around the Constitution, arguments that people make about the Constitution, have actually been used to project or defend American power. So the, the traditional way that people tend to think about constitutionalism and American power, the American national security state is that the constitution is the thing that constrains the security state. This is sort of was implicit in a point that Alex had made that maybe it's the constitution that's restrained Trump. And my basic view about that is that, yes, it's true that discourses of constitutionalism, particularly of civil liberties and you know, we can see this in the courts, we can see this in popular activism, for example, you know, folks going to the, um, to the airports uh, to contest the, the Muslim ban in 2017, have made some of the worst excesses of the past less plausible. We now look back on, um, you know, the internment of Japanese Americans as uh, a national catastrophe. But at the same time, the closeness of constitutionalism to the, the reasons why the US claims to act abroad has also had this weird effect of facilitating more and more expansion within the executive branch. And so it's, it might seem counterintuitive, but it's not necessarily a surprise that the era that we think of as the era of the imperial presidency of an expansive president that's able to operate overseas, including like in January with, you know, as assassinations of significant military figures in foreign countries like Iran, that expansion is taking place just during the same era where there's this kind of massive um, uh, sort of and, and nearly unanimous political embrace of the constitution because of the ways in which the language of constitutionalism sort of facilitates the overall language of, of American power. Um, so that it's not that, that you can't come up with constitutional interpretations that are more respectable of civil liberties. And I think to be a good lawyer in this moment requires being able to operate in the courts and to say, hey, this particular act of violence against you know, enemy combatants or folks at the border is unconstitutional, that's good lawyering. But it's also the importance of recognizing that the constitutional state as a whole kind of facilitates that expansion, even if you can make arguments as a lawyer within the context of that state. Hmm. So I, a series of related questions coming up. One, just about our current kind of sclerotic moment as it turn, as it relates to constitutional amendments, right? We've gone several decades now without amending the constitution and, and sort of how how do you envision that that current impasse right like how does that that relate to what you're talking about a uh, second question from one of my yeah, why don't i just go through these uh, quickly in order i'll try to try to just be really sure. quick about this so this is a big problem which is amendments are effectively a dead letter in the us and they're a dead letter because you know at a moment especially of deep partisan divide being able to get anything with two-thirds support in the house and three-fourths of the, the state's approval is virtually impossible. And that means that 
we have to figure out or improvise modes of constitutional change that democratize our electoral system and that limit the, the sort of the minority power of, um, of like small constituencies uh, without necessarily being able to use an amendment path. And that requires having control of both houses of, of Congress and acting really aggressively during moments of unified government. And that's really different than how it works at the state level. So, you know, at the state level, you have constitutional amendments that might just require 60% of the vote. Um, but we don't have um, a, a, an amendment process like that at the national level. And indeed, the states are much more like the rest of the world than the US is like either state constitutions or constitutions elsewhere. Great, let's see, uh, got a bunch of questions coming in. I don't know that we'll be able to get to all of them. I did wanna uh, see, if, see if Ziz could address Brenna's question. Brenna's one of my intro to honors humanities students, uh, yeah. a class we call the human event. But she asked, you know, how, how do you approach this question of just the historical distance of the constitution? You know, like, um, I, like uh, thinking about the traditional ways of, of categorizing constitutional interpretation I, I wouldn't describe you as an originalist, right? But how would how would you describe your relationship to the sort of historical distance of the Constitution itself? Yeah. So, um, so I, I think that there's there's kind of two different things that that's sort of at stake. Which is one question is how should we view the constitutional system as a whole, and the constitutional system as a decision making apparatus. Um, that has embedded within it um, a design, like a design of a set of institutions. And my own view is that if you look at the constitutional system as a whole, that constitutional system facilitates, unfortunately, minority rule. And that's largely because of the deep suspicions of democracy across a range of, uh, uh, like a range of um, criteria that the framers of the constitution had. Um, and that's actually a problem for the present because we're essentially bound to a, a system of design that is fundamentally incompatible with the principles of mass democracy. Then there's a second question about how should we interpret the text that we have in the context of ongoing litigation and dispute? How do you, how do you interpret the equal protection clause you know, when you're bringing a challenge about the mistreatment of prisoners or the Fourth Amendment when you're thinking about um, police uh, police brutality or um, or or illegal searches. There, you know, my basic view is that originalism as a theory of interpretation, I don't think makes sense on its own terms. Um, that if the theory is based on intent, like well, you know, we want to abide by what the intent of the framers were, even independent of my own moral evaluation of those framers. In most of the cases that we care about in the present, it's gonna be very, very hard to actually discern something like a single coherent intent from a variety of different legislators. And then if the theory is based just on text, well, we just go to the text and the text is objective and tells us you know, some kind of um, disembodied truth. The problem is the text is incredibly vague and open-ended. Our constitution is one of the very shortest in the world. It's about 7,000 words. The average length of a constitution is 20,000. The Indian constitution, the longest in the world, is 150,000. And that means that there's just massive vagueness in the text. And it's for most issues we care about, the text doesn't actually give you an answer. And so that the only way you can do meaningful constitutional interpretation is to basically infuse the text with a set of what you know might think of as like purposive commitments about like, well, what are the actual values that are Im embedded in it? What, what that might mean for the present. What that suggests to me about originalism is that originalism is really best understood as the legal ideology of a social movement. And that that's, that legal ideology is really about at the end of the day, um, preserving a set of values, commitments, and hierarchies that that social movement believes is under threat. And it's not really about how one interprets the past in any kind of like, you know, um, objective manner. And it's not really about, um, uh, you know, uh, 
the success of textualism as a mode of legal expertise. And it means that today, I think a lot of the struggle is really, this is why a lot of the stuff I write is about constitutional memory or historical memory. The struggle is about what are the kinds of narratives and accounts of the past that we're gonna to allow to dominate our politics in the present. And I tend to be deeply suspicious of accounts that fetishize or worship our, in, our past institutions or the framers of the constitution because really standing behind that fetishizing and that worship is a refusal to confront the ongoing forms of subordination that continue to persist and a presentation of the past that is unproductive for making sense of the, the, the social crises that we're, we're in the midst of. I'm gonna to try to synthesize a few questions coming in. I don't know that we'll be, get, be able to get to all of them before we end here in a minute, but um, sort of Brandon and, and Chris asked questions about uh, the Synod and the Electoral College and, and wondering if, if you read the counter-majoritarian um, tendencies in those institutions as, as accidental or, or baked into a racial project, I guess. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I, I think that, um, so I think that they're baked in and they're, they're not accidental. So that the, the reason why the US has a Senate and a Senate that's based on state representation in particular is because folks like Madison understood senates to be upper houses that were aristocratic sites that could contain what were viewed as the, the passions of the majority. And here this is really understood in class terms. The worry was about the infringement on, of property interests by the many, by small scale farmers. Mm -hmm. And you know the way that I read slavery in this conversation is that slavery was one of the property interests that various kinds of um, gentry and commercial elites um, uh, were committed to and were concerned about having usurped or undermined. And so you, it was absolutely part of a conversation about how to maintain a specific kind of elite control in the face of democratic transformations. And then the way that this played out in practice during the antebellum period is that between the three-fifths clause the Senate, um, the Electoral College, and the Supreme Court, um, the effect was that essentially slaveholding interests dominated the national government for large chunks of the 19th century. If you just look at who the presidents are, uh, you know, for the first half of the 19th century, overwhelmingly supporters of slavery or from slaveholding states. And they were similarly able to dominate the Supreme Court as a result. And then in Congress, um, imposed things like um, ga the gag rule, which made it impossible to, to raise bills about slavery um, in, in Congress. You know, so the, in a way, the, the, I think of the politics of white supremacy and the way it played out in our institutions as linking different forms of essentially anti-democratic politics that then just facilitated over time the entrenchment of a specific kind of white oligarchy. And then that, that proceeded after the, the, the defeat of reconstruction in the late 19th and, and early 20th centuries. And it's why W.B. Du Bois, his basic view was that the Senate and state representation was a significant institutional impediment to racial transformation in the US. Well, we're getting close on time here. Um, afraid we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. I'm going to put my email out in the chat if anybody wants so to. I'm, I'm happy to stick around for an extra five minutes if you want to do just yeah, a few. OK, yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, so gosh, uh, are you scanning the Q&A as well, Aziz? Do you have any particular ones? I can. I can... Oh. Uh... So the, I can do this with the constitution was amended 11 times from 1913 to 1970, mm -hmm. um, but we've only amended it once in the last 50 years. How does that fit in? So I, I think what the last moment of really intense constitutional experimentation was in the early 20th century, where you had very powerful progressive and socialist movements, labor movements that were making the, a lot of the arguments that you've heard 
tonight, which is that the Constitution was fundamentally outmoded and undemocratic and needed to be basically transformed. And the power of the labor movement meant that you actually had really, you know, meaningful majorities and super majorities be, um, supporting significant um, reform agendas. And it's why between 1913 and 1920, you had four constitutional amendments passed that were significant, direct election of the Senate, uh, constitutionalization of uh, income taxes, overturning a Supreme Court um, uh, decision. Uh, you had um, temperance, which was so like prohibition of alcohol, which was like a, a, a significant social movement and uh, the right of women to vote. Um, so there has been periods in the past of significant constitutional reform, um, but in many ways, like the, the commitment to significant institutional reform through amendment um, basically wanes in the late 30s um, following the Supreme Court's uh, willingness to constitutionalize uh, uh, New Deal legislation and also in the context of um, some of the debates about totalitarianism and a fear that too much experimentation might lead the country down various kinds of destructive paths. I would also say that then you saw, you did continue to see some constitutional amendments um, up to um, amendment basically reducing the voting age to 18 in the context of Vietnam in 71. But, you know, one of the ways that I would read those amendments is that they passed in a very different kind of partisan context in which there was much, much more reduced um, uh, uh, party polarization. You had a far greater bipartisanship between the parties and it's the very same dynamics that allowed uh, Republicans and, and de some Democrats to work together on things like the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in the mid 60s is also why you had amendments to fix um, you know, various perceived flaws in the constitutional system from the 25th Amendment that's dealing with like, you know, what happens if a president is incapacitated to um, the ban on the poll tax to the re reduction of the, the, the age of the um, uh, 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 voting age. The thing that I say when I teach con law is that if you look at these amendments, so the amendments basically since the progressive period, since the 19th Amendment, and you try to chart the most significant issues in American life just based on what, what amendments were passed, you'd basically miss the heart of American politics because the heart of American politics, the stuff that people really struggle and disagree about, and especially in the last half century, are just not present in the formal constitutional text. And in a way, that's a kind of indictment of the text. So, you know, the, the discussions that the things that you see articulated bear only passing resemblance to the stuff that's actually shaping our politics now. And that's getting more and more extreme as the country is being more, becoming more polarized. Um, I, I might just end on a question that would bring us back to our main yeah. theme and then we'll wrap up. Uh, just to answer some questions in the chat, we will be sharing this, this recording. Uh, and I'll put now my email in the, the chat if any Barrett students want to continue. The conversation, but um, but uh, you know, thinking back to your reading of, of these kind of divergent trends within the Black radical tradition of this kind of radical reading of the American creed versus this decolonial tradition, how do you see that playing out? Do you see the potential of a synthesis? Do you see one one path overtaking the other uh, in um, that idea of a kind of anti-racist account of freedom in the United States moving forward. Yeah. Can, do you mind if, if this is the last thing, if I just respond yeah, to it? Yeah. So I saw one that was, that noted that um, the Democrats actually had control of the Senate until 2014. So this is not a claim that the Democratic Party can never have control of the Senate, um, but it's a claim that the electoral, electoral um, system as a whole is systematically skewed to make it easier for one party to control the Senate than the other. And it's becoming more and more systematically skewed every year because of um, demographic shifts and um, population shifts that are occurring over time. And it means that the moments where you can see real democratizing shifts are only really gonna be those where the Re Democratic Party has unified control because the leadership of the Republican Party does not have an incentive to to significantly democratize the electoral system. 
And so those few moments, it might, you know, it might be in 2021, if Democrats win both of these runoffs in Georgia, it might be in 2022 because it's a more favorable Senate map, then you could imagine unified government. Um, those moments are gonna be relatively few and far between and unless they're taken advantage of, they'll, you'll see the persistence of these kinds of larger dynamics. I saw another question that was about where do people that are not neither black or white fit into this story? And I think that's actually a really important one. So in my own work, one of the things that I argue is that the, the way that many non-white white communities were constructed in the US was so not, not as native peoples, indigenous peoples on the land, but not included as settlers. And you can see this with the treatment of um, Asian migrants, of Mexican Americans um, that, uh, you know, essentially following the, the, the Mexican American war um, were now subject to control by the US government. But unless they were deemed white in places like California were systematically denied voting rights and, and disenfranchised in various ways. And that many of these communities have been constructed historically as essentially different kinds of what I call imperial subjects. In other words, they might not be organized around the same exact relationships of chorus labor, expropriated land that you see with indigenous peoples or enslaved African workers, but through a kind of patchwork of of hierarchical forms of rule that's, that's based on kind of extracting various types of benefits for those that were included as insiders. But the, the differences between these communities are actually substantial. It's one of the reasons why it's really important to recognize how distinct communities ex have very different experiences of subordination and that those distinct experiences also mean that what a liberation project might amount to for Latinx um, you know, migrants in the present may well be distinct and different from what a liberation project means for indigenous peoples or for African-Americans. And it requires for folks that are involved in solidarity politics that's, that's meant to be cross-racial, that's class-based, that's attempting to link brand and, uh, black and brown people, that you have to really pay attention to the differences in working through what like, um, solidarity might mean. And that brings me to, to Alex's final question, which is, you know, my own view about it in thinking about the two different, um, you know, two different traditions within Black politics. And we can think of this generally as the competing reform traditions in the US, reform traditions that embrace some version of creedal nationalism and reform traditions that are much more explicitly about a break or a rupture is that, you know, one of the problems of the last few years, I think, um, on the left, let's say generally, has been a desire to, f to, to determine in advance as a matter of first principles and philosophical position, what, you know, what stance to take, you know, a class first position, class is the universal category, race is the universal category, um, you know, whether or not to reject creedalism as such or to embrace creedalism as the only path. My basic view is that I have a, I have a position. I tend to identify myself more closely with the, the, the kind of black internationalist um, perspective that was suspicious of uh, creedal ideals. But at the same time, I think that the most successful reform efforts in the US have been reform efforts where you've had different constituencies that have come together, not because of first principle, but because of shared interest on the ground and a mutual commitment to achieving tangible reforms that improve the daily experience of people that are, that are oppressed. And this is how, you know, labor movement activists and civil rights activists worked together in the 60s, including in Memphis where King was killed um, doing labor work around a poor people's campaign focused there on the position of sanitation workers. And I think it's the story today, which is solidarity emerges on the ground through everyday acts of assistance um, and alliance 
built around concrete material improvements, it doesn't have to be economic, but concrete improvements that address real grievances that people have. And rather than worrying too much about, you know, which overarching orientation to take, I think the best way to move forward is through, um, you know, through frameworks that allow us to build solidarities. Now, it might be the case that at some point down the line, that there are real disagreements that produce real ruptures, but that's not really where we are at the moment. Where we are at the moment is figuring out how to build outside of the election process real institutional homes for people to experience solidarity and to engage in, in politics. Great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Aziz, for your time. We really appreciate it. And thanks so much to everybody out there in the Barrett community who joined us this evening. Uh, uh, we'll give our kind of virtual thanks to Aziz for his time this evening and uh, to Kira and RG for, for organizing. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you all so much. Thank you. My pleasure.